I wanted, we weren't trying to be antisocial. I had a guest here, and I didn't want to abandon him. Um, it, it is with a particular uh, pride that I'm going to have the opportunity to introduce the two principals of Special Hand School of Arts. Uh, I believe Andrea is going to be doing most of the speaking, but um, I had the uh, privilege of meeting these women last January, a year ago. Um, they both have uh, children that deserve uh, and require special attention. And with uh, there basically being zero funding for arts and uh, music education in our schools nowadays, um, they were looking for a way that they could creatively um, challenge their children and enable their children uh, to be the best possible children that they could be. And in that way, we're then reaching out to see if they could create something that would do the same thing for other families. Um, and I believe that they're honored because there's a parent here of one of their students from the past year. Um, I will tell you that I had a Down syndrome cousin growing up, and while she was very difficult to communicate with, um, she was a great big fan of Elvis Presley, and she could draw. And so she was able to communicate with the rest of us best when she was able to draw and listen to music and play music and respond to music. And so um, what Andrea and Lisa have done is created uh, an art school here in the greater Lafayette community that addresses those needs. I'm going to let them speak um, more clearly to their vision and what has happened in the last year. They have made tremendous strides. Uh, they, this is really their first year anniversary. Um, they were recognized um, at a presentation down at Matchbox, which is, which is the entrepreneur lab um, for any small business or any new business uh, in the greater Lafayette area. And they were voted the best new business of 2014 here in the greater Lafayette area. So I am proud not only I am proud not only uh, for all the things that they've accomplished uh, in the last year, I'm especially grateful that I can now couple both of them my friends. Andrea Reamer and Lisa Halsman. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you guys so much for having us here. I'm really, really excited. Um, I'm even more excited to see some familiar faces, and I, I was doing well uh, until Zane mentioned his adoption, which I'm a little emotional about still, so congratulations, Zane. And uh, so anyways, my name is Andrea, um, and this is Lisa. I'm going to give you a little background about us and how we got started. I'm going to give you a rundown of our programs and then tell you a little more in depth and speak from the heart from there. So um, I was working at Department of Child Services as a case manager, as you just heard. Um, I was struggling as a single mom with a little guy who had special needs who needed me home more than I could be at that point. Um, I was introduced by a service provider to Lisa who also has a special needs son and had a similar vision to me as mine. So uh, she introduced us. We met one early, early, early morning and discussed the idea of how important <coughs> arts are. My background is in art and uh, we, had a, we had such a similar idea that we decided to just go for it. And we did it so fast and furiously, and the community was so open to it that it is going great right now, and we're really excited to share kind of some of our stories and what's been going on and tell you more about it. So um, first of all, we were searching for a place. That was our first mission. And uh, Lisa came across uh, where New Community School was at First Baptist and met with Steve, which is how we met him. And we walked into this building, and it was just meant to be from the start. It was at home. We were at home there. It just felt like uh, it was ready for us from, from day one. So we're located next to Tippecanoe Arts Federation also, which is very convenient. <clears throat> Our grand opening was just this last August, um, August 1st. And so far we have, and this was uh, a little bit dated, but we have a little more than 54 students now, uh, two administrators, eight instructors, and 11 regular volunteers. So it's an intimate group, um, but we're getting more and more students every day. It's just a matter of finding the proper people to, to work with them. Our current programs are uh, listed here. I'm going to go through each one and tell you a little more about it. And this is an exciting presentation for me because now we've talked with parents to make sure they're comfortable with us telling their children's stories, too. So this is Christopher. He's a private student of mine. He has autism. He's 10 years old. And uh, one of the things I, I kind of like to include is a little snippet of each of the students sometimes because that's really where our passion lies with, with teaching. And Christopher is an amazing little artist. He's a very fun and happy kid and his, his specialty is cutting. 
he can cut these intricate little tiny designs. So right now we're working on a private show for him for the next year uh, to display all the stuff that he's doing. So hopefully in the future you'll see more of him. Um, other students for private instruction, we have, we have uh, quite a few teachers who we try to match. We meet with the families and get a feel for what their child, whether they're a young child or an older child, what their needs are, and kind of match them with the instructor whose personality might match best with what they need and uh, experience they've had. So the special needs students that we work with range anywhere from nonverbal you know, autism all the way to cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, ADHD, emotional issues, um, depression even, stuff like that. So the, when we say special needs, there's a huge range that we're working with. It's uh, not limited to any age or diagnosis. Um, our after school arts program, which is our most lively and exciting group. <laughs> it's, uh, we have two groups right now. One is the, uh, they're all around the age of 10 and the other group is more of the high school age. And what we do for the after arts program is it's divided for two hours between art and music. So the first, uh, the two groups go to separate rooms. One does music for an hour, the other does art, and then they switch over. Uh, and it's very open-ended, which I'll explain in a minute um, how our program works, but the kids kind of create their own curriculum in these programs. And then we have an adult program, which is where we have uh, Miss Caitlin and her mom Linda's here today, and uh, I have to say that for the adults, uh, for the adult program, Caitlin has been one of our most exciting students to have. She has come so far in such a short amount of time that I will get emotional talking about her. <laughs> but she she has autism and came in very nervous and has had issues in the past with um, being mistreated in certain environments, having problems in school. Uh, behaviors, behaviors that led from that uh, because she's unable to voice what she's been through and she was unable to voice um, her fears. She came into the school with us very tense and nervous and unsure and now we think she would like to move in <laughs> as of yesterday. She's so at home and comfortable but the great thing is is to see <coughs> how much of her personality is coming out now. She's She's doing things, and her mom can attest to this, that she's never done before. She, she's a part of our conversations. She's learning new things and responding in different ways. It's, it's nothing shy of a miracle. It really is. Um, and I'll explain when I talk about our program kind of how my, my past and how I've worked with people, how, how I'm thinking that this can continue for her. And we are really excited for this upcoming year to see what new things she can be a part of. Um, the Advocacy Arts Program was one, we've only done one of these so far, but it was a huge success, where we try to also encourage local artists and musicians to be a part of what we're doing that have nothing to do with special needs or might not have experience with special needs, but we also encourage people who have been touched or work with those with special needs to promote their own artwork and, and express themselves at our school as well. So the Advocacy Arts exhibit that we had was a mom that I had met uh, she does these beautiful photographs, portraits of her children and other people's children with special needs. So what you see here is her daughters, uh, Kate and Zoe. Zoe has autism and Kate is a type 1 diabetic. And the, the girls created all these paintings and beautiful artworks, so we displayed their artwork and the mom displayed all of her uh, photographs as well. So it was really successful. We're really seeing a huge difference in these kids when they're able to show their work, which was not what the parents thought they would do. They thought they would be nervous and not want to display their work or be a part of it. But they're very proud and excited to do that. It's, so, it's very opposite of what the families thought they would do. So they're up there, and you can see little Zoe at the bottom. Everyone that came in had to see her favorite painting that she did, her little self-portrait, and uh, was very vocal and talkative about this. It was really cute to see. So we'd like to continue and find more artists in that area. Uh, cool School Music is an after-school program that Alex, one of our instructors, uh, our music instructors goes to uh, Miller and Benton Elementary right now for the after school program and does about an hour or so uh, music with the kids and that's going really well and we're starting to expand on that also with other schools. We have open studio and other classes too. We're working with Wabash Center uh, with some of the adults and that's been a very fun and exciting group too. And here's a little list of some of the people that we're currently working with now. Like I said, Miller and Vinton Elementary. We're working on a program with T.C. Harris Academy for in the future. Um, we're currently working with Wabash Center, developing a program with them. Uh, 
CASA and DCS, since that's my background and my heart still kind of a little bit there, uh, we've been working with trying to get some kids in through the CASA program. So we have a couple that we're, we're going to start through there and we'll, we'll expand on that. Sylvan Learning Center, YWCA, and some of the homeschool kids are all <clears throat> some of the extra um, organizations and places that we've been collaborating with. Um, and then who else can we help? We have a whole list of, there's so many places I'd still love to get it to be a part of, including some of the, vet, like the Veterans Home Assisted Living Centers, all the other schools, because we realize that there is an excess of, what was the number for IEPs? 3,200. 3,200. IEPs. An individual educa uh, educational program in school, so kids who need a little extra help in school, over 3,000 of them exist in our county alone. So that's a huge group that might be able to benefit from our program. Um, as well as the surrounding counties. We also would like to work with uh, siblings with special needs, which I think when you grow up with a, a brother or sister or a family member who kind of gets all the attention because they need so much of the attention that the siblings get a little bit pushed aside sometimes or might not get as much attention. And we'd like to have them involved as well. Um, and everyone always asks how they can help, what can they do for us. So we have this general list of we always need supplies, 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 and lots, lots of art supplies. Um, anything that can make the, the building itself feel at home. Uh, services, we're always in need of volunteers, um, janitorial things, um, web design, marketing. Those are areas that we're learning as two moms who are not, uh, do not have a business background. <laughs> we are learning as we go. Uh, but we're very passionate about it, so we will succeed. But uh, we're not shy of begging for, for help sometimes. Um, and then other financial things for scholarships. I think one of the big ones is uh, trying to help pay for some of the students to come who might not be able to afford not only the class, but maybe even just to get there, transportation, that kind of stuff. Um, we need lots of sponsored artists, uh, especially the adult artists who are living on fixed incomes. Um, and anything for classroom renovations. So we try to make it more at home. Uh, we have some students who like to do work and be really productive, but then they like to relax afterwards. And it's that relaxing part we need to help accommodate uh, so they can be comfortable. So what makes us unique, and this is kind of where I want to touch upon um, my background a little more and tell you, speak from the heart a little, a little bit more about how I want this to work and how we've discussed the future of the business to be. I started with working with um, profound handicapped people um, maybe eight years ago and I realized as a caregiver in an establishment how how different they were treated according to how I felt humans should be treated sometimes so there was this this, this lack of, of affection you're not allowed to hug you're not allowed to be their friend you're not allowed you have to keep this sterile environment and, and I didn't do well with that at all I, I ended up I, I had one student Andrea who's I call her the other Andrea. <laughs> she is someone I've been working with for about seven years now. And she's an artist. She is someone who has become a very good friend of mine. And we worked. I worked with her in a in this place. And she opened my eyes a lot to the fact that we as humans get so caught up in business and protocol that we we lose the human element of of working with each other. So I was told at that place I was not allowed to be her friend. Um, we would paint together at work all the time, but I was not allowed to be her friend, and I said that's ridiculous. So I started teaching her at home, and then I started teaching everyone else at home, and then I got a studio. That's kind of where it started. And, uh, and the way I've gone about it, because I've worked with a lot of nonverbal adults, was kind of who I was working with at the time. And it occurred to me how people are treated um, in in these extreme cases, how they're treated like lesser humans. People talk to them like they're babies sometimes. Um, they, they give them activities that are kind of infantile. And, and even I worked in an, a nursing home with um, Alzheimer's patients as well. And I saw that there, uh, there too. And I had this elderly man who was on his last days and couldn't speak. And they gave me this book to read him. And I was very young at the time when I did this. And it was a, a children's book. And I said, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, who, why would he want to hear this? Is this what you would want to hear? You know, so I went and got the Farmer's Almanac. It was the only other thing I could find in there and, and read. And I will always remember because he smiled at me, even though he could barely vocalize anything. And it really touched my heart. And it made me realize that just because people don't speak the way you and I are speaking to each other right now does not mean that's not how they're processing the world. They're processing it the same exact way 
and they deserve to be treated the same exact way. So the problem lies in helping other people understand that. <laughs> so but the child who has a communication disorder, who, who processes the world slightly different, I, I learned through him also um, how to take different approaches with people and how to teach them in different ways. And I, my background is actually I have a bachelor's degree in fine arts in painting is my background with a minor in psychology and I'm working on my master's for painting as well. So I'm not a doctor. I am not a professional therapist and by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I do think that it's possible to be able to touch people and change their lives without having that scientific degree behind you. And that's what I'm going to push for at the school. We have found a few instructors who are fabulous with this. They, they genuinely care about the students and love them and, and try to help adapt the program to what works for them. So when we're working with these students, especially ones who aren't able to voice their opinions, um, it's really important to just tell the family that the first couple months might just be nothing. We might just be spending time together and forming a bond and connecting and learning what they like and what they don't like. And then the program goes from there. So it's been really hard up until this, up until now, to, to give presentations and explain to everyone, well, what are you going to do? What's your curriculum? Like, we don't have one. We don't have a curriculum. <laughs> we can't have a curriculum. It's impossible. If you put five autistic children in a room together, you cannot teach each one the same way. It will never happen. <laughs> so that's what makes us unique. We are going to try to maintain that for all of eternity, uh, being able to connect personally like that and to find other people who can do the same. So, uh, and here's some of our kiddos. Uh, mine's a little guy in the front with a guitar. <laughs> Lisa's is in the back with the stripes. And then my student Andrea is up there as well. And Kate was another one from the photograph. Um, so, and to, to kind of expand more on what I was just saying about the human element and how, we are, how we're teaching people to use music and art as a way of communicating. And Caitlin's mom is here today, so uh, I'm happy she's here to hear this as well. Uh, this was one a moment with Caitlin that was really kind of like the Farmer's Almanac moment for me. But Caitlin did not trust me when she came in. We sat down, she painted, she'd do stuff, but she was does it. And then she was mostly interested in music. So her focus was kind of in the music room with, with a couple of our instructors. But I would still offer art if she wanted to. And the great thing about our program, too, is if she was not interested, she could get up and go in the music room. We don't have these boundaries and these rules where you have to stick to a schedule. Um, we keep make sure the teachers are open to just change things as they go also. So Caitlin, who <coughs> wasn't too sure about me, all of a sudden started painting. And not only did she start painting, but she loves painting now and can do it for longer than we can even sit for. <laughs> so it's really great. But the moment with this was great for me was because she would sit down and she would start painting her hands. And this was, uh, <laughs> this was a little unconventional for some. And we have a volunteer who was way uncomfortable. She, she would leave and be like, you know, you guys are nuts. And, I said, that's OK. I said, just let you know. We just let her do what she wants to do. This is how she's expressing herself. And so on this particular day, she was painting her hands. And she'll paint on the paper as well. But I offered my hand to her. And she looked at me like I was nuts, first of all, <laughs> because aren't I supposed to be telling her to clean up or something? But she reached out and shared her paint with me. And it was a small little gesture, maybe, to anyone passing by. But it was huge to me. And it was huge to her and gets me a little <laughs> emotional as well. And since then, um, she's just come so far in allowing people in. And this is really kind of a, a, a major, a major sh uh, it really shows what we want. This is, this is what we want to have happen with everyone. We want every family to feel comfortable, and we want their kids, whether they're younger or older, to, to feel at home too, and to really use art and music to, to be able to connect with people like this. So. <laughs> Did you have anything you want to say? I guess any questions? So, so I'm sort of interested. So you have no boundaries, which is kind of like sort of school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but if Caitlin doesn't feel like art today and wants mm -hmm. to join, is is there a music program going on, or just a music yes. instructor there? Either the instructor that? will be there, or I'll just go with her, or we'll let her kind of if she needs time to herself. She can go do that as well. So one of Caitlin's things, which is really fun, is when she was done painting, she'd be done, she'd go lay on the floor. That was her thing. <laughs> she'd go lay on the floor. So we just let her. And we would have conversations and kind of make sure she was still comfortable. But And every now and then, you'd offer her something to do, um, a dry erase board, 
Um, I have a yoga ball. She loves that now. She will be rolling all over the place while we're talking. But I think the key is, is and, mom, and mom can explain this too, she really wants to come up and talk today, but um, Caitlin normally wouldn't be able to stay in this room and hang out like this. I think mom, when we first met the family, and I told her when we first interviewed them, like, you guys are amazing parents. I mean, 100% of their life is dedicated to their daughter. 100%. Not even 99%, but 100 But they looked tired. They looked exhausted. They needed, they needed help. They needed an outlet. They needed support. And you, and you can see that in them. So now I think, I'm thinking mom enjoys it just as much as Caitlin does because when Caitlin hangs out, then we get to talk and we get to hang out. And, and, and mom can vent or mom can ask questions. And, and one thing that we realized too in talking with families as closely is how much help they need in the school system, knowing their rights. And Lisa, who's been doing uh, school advocacy issues, um, working with school advocacy for about 20 years now for her own son, knows their rights. She we can bring out all the paperwork and she's like, okay, do you have this, do you have this? So we're currently helping Caitlin get more help in the home, um, whether it be me or someone else, because I'm kind of attached to Caitlin right now. But, uh, but to, to be able to go into the school, because she's out of school now, but if she was in school still, I think they really could have benefited from knowing more about what they, what options they had for help and what options they had for different things. So we're learning from the parents and organically letting this program develop around what the community we realize needs. And it wasn't anything we could predict at first because you don't know what other families are going through or, or anything, but they're teaching us. <laughs> it's, it's terribly individual and you don't, Yes. and, and nobody's paid attention for a long time. Very long time, yes, and some very horror, big horror stories. You'd be surprised at what, maybe not what, what what we've heard. So, did you have a question? How are you funded? Do you want to take this one over? <laughs> Repeat the question. Um, he's asking how we're funded. Um, we um, have been um, charging our students, and they um, pay a minimal fee. Um, and we are solely relying on fundraising efforts of anything from doing um, Christmas card sales to that our students um, or uh, schools have made for us. The Battleground Middle School does a Christmas card every year, which is where my son attends. And um, we sell those. Um, we've had a professional boxing and wrestling event here in West Lafayette. And we made some money from there. And then um, people actually have just seeked us out and donated privately um, to our <coughs> Facebook page or our PayPal account. On your, on your slide, you actually had a, also a, a position of a grant writer. Correct. Right. How, how, how successful have you been on that? Well, we're just at the beginning stages of that. <laughs> so we've only done, what, two grants so far. One we were denied for because we hadn't been open long enough, and the other one is still pending. But we're having people write. Uh, so the current one right now is for a preschool. Um, is writing a grant for us to come in every day to work with the preschool. So we're starting to, people are starting to see what we're doing and, and understand it a little more, um, and that's helping them seek us out and, and look for help and to help us get funded. So, and yeah, we've had some very non traditional sources of funding. The boxing one was great, it was a professional boxer and a professional wrestler. The boxer has a son with autism, and he actually came to us and said, I'd like to make some money for you guys. And we said, well, gee, okay. <laughs> That's fine. And so him and his friend uh, got together, and they, they did everything, pretty much everything for us. And they had this huge event where they were a boxer versus a wrestler, and all the proceeds were divided between us and his son's organization down in Evansville. And that was great. We've had tattoo parlors offer any autism-related tattoos. The funding goes to us, or the money goes to us. Um, even little things like taverns will come and say, <laughs> We did. Uh, we matched dollars for shots last night for you, and just give us an envelope of cash. It's, it's very non-traditional, but we love that. We love that we're tapping into these places that you know they might not feel comfortable going and supporting other groups because we're also a little non-traditional. You know, we we're a little outside the box, and and it's bringing in some really unique uh, help from the community. So, so that's really a lot of fun for us. <laughs> yes. You have five hundred one c three status. No, not at the moment. We do not. No, um, that is the possibility for a future, um, but that's still under discussion. One of our main issues when we were discussing non for profit was how unique the program was and who we would trust to be a part of it as a board <coughs> member. Um, I'm not from here. I've only been here since 2010. Making a group of people 
um, get together and make decisions for something that I'm so passionate about was it something I wanted to jump right into. So it's kind of in the works. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yes. Are most of these sessions where the kids come in, are they like one hour sessions or do you have some of them hang around for several hours? Uh, both. Uh, the private classes are a one-hour session. Uh, the after-school class is a two-hour session. The young adult program is a three-hour. It's supposed well. It's supposed to be an hour of music, hour of art, and then lunch afterwards. Uh, we do house sometimes. Ever we do hang out all day, <laughs> depending on uh, if the students are happy and the parents are having fun and we have the time and availability. We'll just hang out and do that too. And. So, and we do have, we, our plans for open studio started uh, with some of the adults who would come in and want to just work, but we realized that they really wanted attention, so them just coming and working independently without people to interact with was not working yet, so we're going to revamp that and, and have some people available. <coughs> and that's a, a lot of what our volunteers, what we need volunteers for sometimes, is just to connect with somebody. They're there because they want to have that social interaction, probably more than anything. Yes? So does that mean that a volunteer doesn't have to be especially talented in the arts, but sympathetic? Absolutely. Absolutely. You do not have to have any knowledge of music or art. You just have to be a good person <laughs> it's, with, it's, a, with it's, a clean it's, criminal it's record. It's, it's, <laughs> it's being able to be comfortable. Yes. Yes. And to connect and to, and to dedicate some time, because especially those with autism are very uh, set in routine. And so if they come and they expect you there on a you regular basis, yeah, you have to be there. And... Like my, my student, Andrea, that I worked with for many, many years when I worked at it was CDC Resources in Rensselaer, and if I didn't come to work that day, she would sit in the lobby and wait for me. She wouldn't do any, anything. So they, they bond with you, and they, they, need the, they need your friendship. You know, that's kind of what they're lacking in the world sometimes. Like I said, in all these sterile environments, rules or regulations. So. <laughs> any other questions? Don't, don't go away. Don't go away. Um, I would like to just add one or two uh, comments real briefly before we close. Um, when I met Andrea and Lisa last year, oh, by the way, I want to let you know that they alternate. Lisa is very uh, articulate herself. They alternate presentations, and since Lisa spoke last at the Optimist, um, she, she was silent today. Um, but when I met Andrea and Lisa last January, when they had this vision of what they wanted to do, um, one of the things that they were talking about was financing and um, and support. So to, to answer your question, Roy, um, they did not form initially as a 501c3 because they would have had to yield the control to a board. However, they are, um, they are a tenant in a 501c3 corporation of Friends of the Education Building downtown behind First Baptist, and we as a 501c3 have been supporting them. I want everyone to know they did not pay themselves for the first year until the week after Thanksgiving, the very last week in November. They have poured their heart and soul into this work. But it's now, when you're down the road, where you can actually see these are the results. There are not just 54 students. Those are 54 individual lives and families that have been touched by the special needs. And for those of us in Kiwana say that we want to improve the community one child at a time, they not only have 54 students who have come, they have dozens more now on a waiting list that if they had enough resources, that they would be able to expand a whole range of services. Um, so at Matchbox, um, which was almost an American idol for new businesses in 2014, while there are a lot of incredible, really insightful new ideas, new initiatives, um, profitable uh, enterprises, to hear the two of them talk from their heart about what they've been able to accomplish um, was very meaningful and resonated with the board, which included a member of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, someone from Cranert at Purdue, someone from the Greater Lafayette Chamber of Commerce. This has been a great blessing to the Greater Lafayette community, and I want to thank them for their time. They are looking for grants. They're looking for funding. I had never heard of doing shots for a... Uh, <laughs> but I want to let you know, just to hear them, if you have a moment, come up and meet them. These are absolutely wonderful women that are filling a critical need in our community. Uh, thank you for addressing Kiwanis. Uh, these are individual lights to help continue to sh shine lights in very unusual places. And thank you for coming today.